Hi, everybody. Welcome or welcome back to That Makes Sense, Sense with a C, the show where we get real about consumer industry trends. So this is our second special quick take edition, and it's a very important one. It's related to the struggle we're all feeling and experiencing right now. So I have the fortune of virtually sitting down with Dr. Patricia Buckley, who is a managing director for economics here at Deloitte. Among other publications, she produces Issues by the Numbers, which is a data-driven examination of important economic policy issues and regularly briefs members of Deloitte's executive leadership team on economic policy and changes to the U.S. outlook. She's graciously agreed to come on to my show today to help us make some sense out of everything we're seeing in the news and online as it pertains to COVID and any related consumer economic impacts. In short, we'll discuss what these coming months might hold for U.S.-based businesses and consumers in the COVID-impacted world. Patricia, thank you so much for being here today. Well, thanks for having me, Bobby. Looking forward to it. So, Patricia, I'm relatively confident you'd agree, given our conversations, that all of the economic analysis you've done throughout your illustrious career would lead you to say that when it comes to predicting, or shall I say, trying to predict what the world will look like in the latter half of 2020, seems like all bets may have gone out the proverbial window. That's true. But first, I want to clarify that people tend to get economists mixed up with fortune tellers. We're not in the prediction business. I think it's more useful to think of us as storytellers. We we come up with how we think based on current trends, things are going to develop. And we usually develop three or four storylines to go along with it because it's kind of, think of it as an if-then sort of exercise. If this happens, then this will be the result. But you know, going back to your, you know, your point, this is going to be unlike anything we've ever seen before. Just to give you a sense of how fast this unfolded, in the forecast that we were getting ready to publish in January, we had the probability of a recession at only 25% this year. By the time February rolled around, we were looking at that going, this is impossible. And by early March, we were sure we were in a recession already. So going from a 25% probability of a recession to 100%, you know, in less than two months is pretty remarkable. And as we're thinking through this, the one thing that's been driving me crazy lately is that people keep talking about the new normal. Nothing about the situation is normal. This is not a normal recession. And when we think about putting this into a framework, I think it's more useful to look at pre-COVID and post-COVID. After the financial crisis, we were you know, searching for the new normal. That was a type of recession we were familiar with. And talking about a new normal made sense. But in this current context, I really don't think calling it any, whether it's a new normal, um, it's too abnormal to be a new normal. It sounds like in the sense of storytelling that this isn't, you know, a sequel to something we've already seen. This is a brand new story. This is the first of, you know, what hopefully isn't a a trilogy, but is something that uh, we aren't, we aren't as familiar with. And so this conversation today will really then be an exploration of, you know, what are the most likely possibilities and how they might play out like a story. So I won't ask you to do any fortune telling today, but we'd love to get your very informed thoughts on the topic. So would you mind uh, just getting started by giving us an overview of what you believe to be the absolute best possible case scenario? And then we can move on to some of the less positive ones. Sure. I feel almost bad calling this our most optimistic scenario, but it really is. But we have the economy contracting at three times the rate that it contracted um, during the financial crisis. That in and of itself is hard to get your mind around. Remember we used to call the financial crisis the Great Recession? It is minorly compared to what we're gonna be experiencing now. But the optimistic part of this, and sadly, I believe this is becoming less and less likely, was we were thinking a really sharp downturn followed by a fairly quick recovery, with recovery starting at the end of of this year. 
But with the growing uncertainty about how difficult it is to reopen, I think even our most optimistic, which is pretty bad, is becoming itself less likely. And so if that's the best case, the worst case is if something else happens to compound what's going on. You know, so we've got the shutdown going on, but say something like a financial crisis were to be thrown into the mix, then we could have a recession that's even twice as bad as our really bad optimistic scenario. And we take longer to recovery, say, you know, early to mid 2021. Our third scenario is in, in some, I think it's actually worse than the those, call it the financial crisis scenario. We call it the long, hard slog. If we start to reopen, things get in, improved so the recession isn't as deep initially as the financial crisis scenario. But if we get another hit and the economy has to slow itself down again, we could have a really long slog to get out of this, where the recession itself you know, last, you know, to the end of the year or beyond, and it takes a lot longer to dig out of. So taken together, you know, bad, really bad, and absolutely horrible. So, well, maybe, maybe because spring is almost here, and I actually don't want people to turn this off right now and, uh, you know, go do something else. I do like to look at the bright side, and I did hear a little bit of bright side in there, which is even in your worse and even worse scenarios growth should eventually return. I'd love a quick comment on that. Yeah, I mean, growth, I firmly believe, you know, we will get back to a period where the U.S. economy is growing. But when and how fast, and this is important, what exactly that post-COVID economy looks like are really, you know, up for grabs right now. Got it. Okay. So while it is very difficult to compare the COVID-19 recession to the financial recessions of the past, including 2009, you know, because of the flashpoint of a global health crisis on top of it, we have talked in some of our previous conversations about a few areas that might be able to provide a point of reference or at least some guidance for folks to think about how to navigate the waters ahead. So what what can we recall and learn from the recession of 2009, for instance? And what should we absolutely have selective amnesia and totally forget from 2009 because it just won't apply? Well, I think the, the most important thing policymakers learned in 2009 was you need to act fast. And living through it, I was really impressed how fast I thought the Fed was moving. The Fed is moving so much faster this time. I mean, they dropped interest rates to zero. They've opened all kinds of lending facilities. They are, and Chairman Powell is constantly on the news, you know, talking about how the Fed will do whatever it takes. This puts confidence back in the market that we're not going to end up with a full-blown financial crisis, I think. And I mean, what Congress has been able to accomplish is pretty darn remarkable. The fact that they were they passed three bills in March and one in April, you know, I think is great. I th- think something that we've, we've got to remember is people refer to all the spending, which is, you know, well upwards of $3 trillion so far, isn't traditional stimulus. It's more trying to make sure enough of the economy survives that when we turn the corner on the health crisis, there's something to go back to. At that point, I think we pick up the playbook again from the financial crisis, and then we're going to need real stimulus spending. So what we had so far, you know, you can almost think about putting the economy on a respirator to keep it going. When we turn the corner on the health, we're going to need the stimulus. And there, I think we can look back to the kinds of things that were tried, what worked, what didn't work in the financial crisis to get the economy growing again. Very interesting. So the response of this is is totally new up front. But as we recover from at least the health portion of it, then, you know, sort of the and, th- and try to get back to thriving, then, you know, the playbook seems to, to to apply more. I think that's really interesting. And frankly, from my, I'll admit, probably naive viewpoint, you know, when times are good, 
things like public policy, you know, the private sector, healthcare system, and, and, and all these different institutions appear to me to be operating relatively independently and disconnected enough that a little mix up in one doesn't necessarily have a material impact on, on another. But today with a sort of a two front crisis that's simultaneously impacting both public health and consumer economics, I feel that it might be highlighting just how interconnected and interdependent it all is. Could you comment on that? Sure. You know, and I, I think you're exactly right here. When this first started unfolding in China, our only thought was, oh, this is going to cause supply chain disruptions. So the focus was on companies you know, that are importing products from China. Now, to your point on interconnectedness, it's you know, take a smaller example, a, a university or a college town. The schools are closed down. The students aren't there. Think of what an economic driver a college is for a particular town. You know, the, the rental base of where the students live, the bars, the fact that most college towns are touted as great retirement communities. So you have people flocking there because of the arts, the, you know, the potential for, for adult learning. It, it is an ecosystem where you've taken the main driver out of play. And more broadly, what's going on with the state and local governments is going to be a huge challenge to get out of. So you've got people coming to the state for aid. At the same time, the states are experiencing a huge loss in revenues, income taxes, um, you know, hotel accommodation taxes. I mean, Remember when we used to travel, going to a hotel, always being shocked about what proportion of the total cost of a hotel were taxes. That's not being collected now. Think of all the retired and soon to retire firefighters, policemen, teachers who depend on state pensions. Those pensions in large part, for many states are underfunded. How are they going to adjust to that? So when we start talking about reopening, we turn back to this interconnectedness. What does it mean to reopen? What does it mean if the rules put in place are one person on an elevator? How do you go from you know, the first floor to the 64th floor in 30 Rock when there's one person at a time on an elevator? The way businesses have to work together, the way with their employees, have we lost organizational capital through this? You know, if you were to reopen, are your workers still around? So it's going to be incredibly complicated, which is why, you know, I'm kind of turning away from a more, more optimistic scenario, because the longer the economy stays in this respirator state, you know, the harder it's going to be to come back. I think that paints the picture overall of how complex this is and how many different uh, things have to be addressed for us to sort of move back in a direction um, that is optimistic. And you, you also made me think I need to start walking the stairs at my house more so I can be ready when I do go back to the office in case I have to take the stairs uh, there as well and, and make it up without being short of breath. But one thing I wanted to change and get back to kind of the, the topic is because this is a consumer-focused show, can you zoom in on that just a little bit and talk about some of the impacts that you could see or we could see on consumer spending? Sure. I mean, it's we went and looked back at consumer spending over past business cycles, and there's fairly remarkable consistency about what happens during a downturn. People put off buying durables, and you know, the, the spending on the non-durables goes down some, but not nearly as much. Then what happens when the expansion starts, things pick up. People go back to and make up for, in large part, the washers and dryers, the, the automobiles, the bigger purchases that they've put off. But in this case, I don't think past is prologue. I guess the question is fundamentally, how will behaviors change pre and post-COVID? I think that some of the change in behavior is going to be persistent behavior changes. So opening up a restaurant doesn't mean people necessarily will go to the restaurant. The 
businesses have felt if they feel there's this telework experiment that they've been forced into is actually very efficient, why would I need to buy automobiles or as many automobiles if I'm working from home? You know, will I need work clothes if I'm in my exercise clothes all day long? So I think the fundamental composition of consumer spending on both the durable side and the non-durable side, you know, is going to be fundamentally different post-COVID. Totally. I mean, I think that's spot on. And I, here's kind of what I learned from our conversation and how I internalize it, that, you know, what you're saying is consumer needs have undeniably changed in this moment to adapt. And we don't yet know how many of those, you know, responses will stick and kind of continue on versus how much will shift back towards, and I apologize for using this, but quote unquote, you know, normal. And that's why I use the quote unquote, right? I, I kind of find it easy to conceptualize this in the concept of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. So for now, people are at the bottom of the pyramid, basic needs, right? Physiological safety. But at some point, and hopefully in the near future, they will look to fulfill those higher needs of things like love and connectedness and they just might do it in a much different way than before early 2020 happened. So as always, we could probably go on for a lot longer, but we won't because this is a quick take. Uh, if you wanted to read and study more of Dr. Buckley's work, you can find it published and regularly updated via Deloitte Insights. Thanks a lot, Patricia, for joining me today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And that's it for now on this special quick take episode. We will see you all on the next episode of That Makes Sense. You can listen on your favorite podcatcher, whether it be Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Spotify. Simply search for That Makes Sense. Connect with me on social media, Bobby Stevens on LinkedIn or at Bobby Stevens on Twitter. This presentation contains general information only and Deloitte is not by means of this presentation rendering accounting, business, financial, investment, legal, tax, or other professional advice or services. This presentation is not a substitute for such professional advice or services, nor should it be used as a basis for any decision or action that may affect your business. Before making any decision or taking any action that may affect your business, you should consult a qualified professional advisor. Deloitte shall not be responsible for any loss sustained by any person who relies on this presentation.